We're down to 55. Oh, there we go. All right, welcome. Thanks. It's great to see a large group here and online. I'm really excited about today. This is our, I think, our fifth annual Equity Award lecture. Um, and today we're going to have uh, the honor of having both Charles Winden and Elena Soy talk about their projects. So the Atlantic Fellows, uh, or the GBHI driven, Atlantic Fellows driven award uh, locally is called the Population Health and Brain Health Equity. So this is designed through the Dean's Department, the, the, the Dean of Medicine, a, a program that began back in 2019 and we joined in the first year. The program doesn't have the word brain in it, but we've added brain to ours. It's a population health and health equity award across the campus. So the nursing school, uh, medicine, uh, dentistry, I believe, all these programs have supported by providing $20,000 in funding and award and a curated set of uh, events for the people selected to be awardees. And since the inception of that program, GBHI has asked early career faculty that are engaged with our Atlantic fellows to submit applications. And we've now received, we've now funded five different applications. You can see them here beginning. We're very proud of uh, this history, so proud that Carolyn and Niall created this wall of fame, which will be going up and uh, in a wild building. I called it Mac East. I think it's east of where we are now, but the, the Memory and Aging Center over in the third floor of Wild Building will soon be announcing this in a wall of fame um, for, for these folks. And great uh, gratitude to, to Carolyn and now for that work. And of course, um, Carmen for organizing this lecture and, and just about everything in my life. So this is really very exciting for us. Over the past five years, we funded $100,000 through the Memory and Aging Center and the GBHI together to try to transform our communities. This is really important for us because we need to walk the walk. We have fellows coming from around the world that are working to transform their communities. And unless we are also trying to transform our communities, um, our, our work is rather hollow. So we're really proud of this work. We support the outreach team. We support faculty that are doing work in Hunters Point uh, in Chinatown, as well as in our Spanish speaking populations. And it's a big part of our mission to advance um, the care for people living here in San Francisco. So with that, as a, uh, a quick introduction, I want to move uh, immediately on to our first speaker, who is Charles. Charles will talk about increasing diversity of autopsy cohorts for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias through comprehensive education and novel community partnerships. And as I said, this work is being done uh, with, with Salvo Spina, who we're very happy to have here as well. So Charles. Okay, so I'm not Charles, obviously, so, and seems like I won't be in the Wall of Fame uh, <laughs> either. But um, I mean, uh, I, I'm happy to be here, and uh, uh, this was a great opportunity. I just want to tell you, just for a few minutes before I leave the, uh, the podium to, to Charles, uh, how these collaborations uh, uh, developed. So when this announcement was done, I was actually working on my own. And for other reasons, on uh, um, the uh, you know, racial and ethnic composition of the brain bank and the numbers, the numbers, are, are not, uh, they, they still look uh, unusual in, in in the sense on how uh, the representation of groups that are uh, minoritized remain uh, underrepresented compared to uh, their presence in the general population. So when this announcement actually was launched, uh, I, I, I immediately sent an email to Charles and say, Charles, this is something that really bothers me. And I think this could be really an area that we could uh, explore. And Charles was already working on, on this and said, well, actually I had the same idea. This was something that I had in mind for a while. So why don't we do something together? So since then, uh, um, really leveraging on the uh, extraordinary uh, type of connections that Charles has developed with the African-American community of San Francisco, we have thought about putting together a, um, a product, really. Like, so the product that would have been like the outcome of this, uh, of this small grain. So for a while, we thought about what we're going to do. Um, you know, we can build up a, a book, we can build up like some kind of uh, uh, pamphlet, uh, um, the visual uh, type of tool that could be distributed within the communities, or we can maybe organize a series of conference, but then we ended up deciding uh, to actually um, uh, create a, a very intimate type of relationship with a, a group of people 
from the community that Charles knew uh, very, very well. And then we decided to, um, um, uh, to name as ambassadors, so ambassadors for us. So we decided to spend you know, all of these this efforts in build up a very um, nice um, uh, opportunity to encounter these people. Uh, we asked them the questions that they wanted to be addressed. We uh, organized an event in which we uh, tried our best to make them feel special. We also planned to have uh, an equal amount of time for us to answer their question, but also for them to tell us exact exactly what is it they want, what is it they need uh, in order to be uh, more involved in science and to be ambassador of the importance of uh, uh, of brain donation for uh, for research. So this was a great event, and I have to thank uh, I know of course GBHI for supporting this project, but most of all Charles for this extraordinary opportunity for me to actually meet this community. So, Charles. All right. Hopefully everyone can hear me online. Um, tremendous thanks to Victor and everybody who uh, supported this project, GBHI, and tremendous thanks to you, Salvo. Um, your, your ideas and your insight and really guidance in this project uh, was, was um, incredibly valued. And so we'll jump right into it. So why autopsy? Why brain donation? A little bit of background on this topic. So we know that ethnocultural groups are underrepresented in autopsy data, despite a diversifying aging population. And so if you look at the actually NAC database, which is the largest collection of autopsy data for ADRD, over 7,300 neuropathological examinations, fewer than 6% of participants are African-American. Um, we focus on the African-American community, as was mentioned, but we know there's a representation of other groups as well. There's an overrepresentation of highly educated individuals within the NAC database, and there's also an underrepresentation of individuals from socioeconomically diverse backgrounds as well. Many of the socioeconomic measures that we use to measure these backgrounds aren't actually even captured. And so the table on the right is the table from a research study looking at individuals uh, who had at least one uh, clinical visit between 2005, 2015, who were UDS participants who were autopsied. And you can see of the 2,046 participants total, 123 of these individuals were labeled as non-white. Um, that term in and of itself is, is not favored, but 123 individuals non-white, which is about 6% of the total sample. If you look at the education for these individuals, about 56% of individuals were college graduates. Right. This is despite the fact that, as I mentioned, our aging population is rapidly diversifying. So uh, the chart here is U.S. Census data between 2010 and 2018. That's color coordinated, color coordinated according to different ethnocultural groups. And you can see for the age ranges, ages 40 to 64, as well as age 65 and older, that our population in the U.S. is becoming more and more diverse, our aging population. You see greater representation of Latino individuals, Asian American individuals, as well as African American individuals and other underrepresented groups as well. So these were our original project aims. Uh, we sought to identify currently underrepresented populations within the MAC autopsy cohort. We wanted to develop a comprehensive educational uh, curriculum on autopsy and evaluate the impact of this curriculum. And we wanted to really investigate some novel community partnerships that we could use to increase the number of potential brain donors. So to start with looking at representation in the MAC brain bank. So this is data pulled from approximately a year ago when we started our project. And you can see uh, of the 865 individuals that we identified in the brain bank, uh, our representation of underrepresented groups has a little bit of a ways to go, I'll put it that way. So you can see age, about 71.4 was the average of really quite some young individuals, but also some very old individuals in our group. You can see the distribution of sex. Uh, we actually only had five African-American individuals in total out of 865 in our brain bank per this data. You can see some individuals identify as Chinese, individuals who identify as Filipino, Japanese, all of these individuals, less than 1% of our total brain bank when you look at the numbers. In terms of ethnicity, individuals who identify as Latino, uh, 26 in total, so less than 5%. And when you consider essentially the diversity of the San Francisco Bay Area, these numbers are obviously quite skewed. I don't need to tell you that. I'm sure many recognize that. I think the other thing that was interested in pulling this data was really seeing the 
absence of data or the amount of incomplete data. So for example, if you look at the number of individuals where we had race categorized, we actually were missing about 90 folks. For individuals who identified in terms of ethnicity, we only actually had 532 out of 865. So a lot of missing data, which I think is incredibly important when we think about representation and how we're keeping track of representation of groups in our brain bank. If you look at the underrepresented populations more specifically, kind of one by one, there are a couple of additional things that come up. So looking at African-American individuals, which again, Salvo and I focused on, really quite young. So average for the autopsy cohort, the brain bank, 71.4. Average for this group, 63.2. It's quite a bit different. We don't actually have a single African-American male in our brain bank, as per this data. Uh, they were all English speaking, primary language. When you look at the other cohorts, again, some interesting things come up. So individuals identify as Latino, Chinese American, Filipino American, as well as Japanese American. For um, age distribution, quite different. So you can see individuals identify as Filipino and Japanese American, again, very small numbers, but younger than the average age of the overall brain bank. You can see there's a skew also in terms of sex distribution across the different underrepresented groups. Education is quite interesting. So for our African-American folks, really quite highly educated, much more of a range of education for some of the other underrepresented groups. And I think obviously language representation is a huge part and an important part of our brain bank. And you can see the language uh, representation here uh, detailed. Again, there was missing data as well when we did this poll. So as Salvo mentioned, we sought to develop kind of a unique educational experience. And we talked about how we were actually going to go about doing this. We talked about using some of the existing data to be able to put together an educational curriculum, but ultimately decided on starting from scratch. So what we did is we surveyed over 80 of our community uh, dwelling individuals through a comprehensive survey and tried to assess from them what it is that they truly wanted to learn about brain donation, where they felt there were gaps in knowledge. We had about a 25% response rate. I think there's a lot that can be said about that just in and of itself that we don't quite have time to go through. But I wanted to highlight the responses to some of the questions in particular. So this was a question actually at the end of the survey where we asked pretty openly about what folks thought would be most helpful in terms of learning about brain donation. There are a lot of responses with regards to just the logistics of donating in and of itself, the process of brain donation, what happens with the brain itself, um, concerns about figure, physical disfigurement, et cetera, et cetera. There were also responses with regards to past experiments, so potentially alluding to some of the historical mistreatment of certain groups in the scientific realm. Uh, again, logistics, as we see in response number three, there are also questions about, you know, the impact of this research, who sponsors this research, what is the benefit of it? One individual also alluded to what is gained additionally by having individuals who are more representative in terms of gender, culture, et cetera. And then the final response is quite interesting. This individual actually indicated that they felt they didn't need to learn more about brain donation because they actually thought they had, because they had indicated that they were donors from a DMV purpose, that that actually included brain donation. So there was a lot of education that occurred around that, that came out during the day itself. Some of the other responses from the survey, just to highlight, we asked about religion and spirituality. In the literature, this is really highlighted as a barrier, quote unquote, to donation for a lot of individuals. 100% of our individuals indicated that their spirituality would not conflict with them actually being able to donate their brain. And we had multiple faith-based organizations represented in our cohort. We asked about historical mistreatment, whether or not that impacted the decision or the thought process behind donating. And we did find that there were about 14% of individuals who indicated they wouldn't want to donate because of historical mistreatment. Interestingly, almost four, more than 40% indicated that historical mistreatment would have really no impact on their willingness to donate. Finishing off a couple of other things, again, a lot of this is in the literature, but the role of family. Family has been highlighted as a major component of successful brain donation as well. We actually found 72% of our cohort indicated that they would still donate, even if their family disagreed with the decision. Maybe a little bit different from what the literature has reported. And then finally, familiarity. Familiarity with brain health research, familiarity with the team that's actually going to be doing the um, logistical aspect of, of, of the brain donation. 
And we found that there, you know, about a quarter of folks indicated they would be uncomfortable if they didn't have some level of familiarity with the personnel and the project itself. So our delivery item, again, how are we going to make this a unique, unique experience? We decided, as Salvo mentioned, ultimately moving away from something like a webinar or a set of, of educational lectures and really try to create an intimate experience, an actual day experience. So we had 13 members of the community actually come and visit the MAC. We basically logistically planned so that we would cover any potential barriers. So we transported everybody to the MAC who needed a ride, we provided food, we provided everything we could think of. Uh, these individuals represented various San Francisco Bay neighborhoods, and we had a number of different activities. So we went through educational lectures. We actually visited the brain bank itself and looked at some of the specimens. And then we had group meals and discourse about the presented information. The um, image on the right is just a screenshot of the pamphlet. So we developed individualized pamphlets that we handed out to each and every individual as well that gave them kind of a schedule for the day. So. We'll go through a few pictures. I hope this doesn't crash because they're kind of data heavy. But we really went into uh, a lot of detail about everything from brain anatomy to historical mistreatment to the importance of brain autopsy. Uh, we were in WILE 381 for this purpose. Um, you can see some of the pictures here, myself speaking. Salvo went into detail about the actual logistics of how autopsy is done, including pictures about how it's done. Uh, and it elicited quite a, a series of reactions, um, which, which were overwhelmingly positive, I will say. Uh, Salvo talked also and, and, and really emphasized the importance of brain donation from a standpoint of discovery, how critical it has been in terms of advancing the science which is quite well received. As I mentioned, there were quite a few reactions. Um, this was actually a reaction where there, there was quite a bit of laughing in the room, as I believe somebody likened one of the frozen sections to um, a pork chop. Somebody said it looked kind of like a pork <laughs> chop. Couple of other things, again, the actual uh, procedures behind brain donation, you know, the, the, the real logistics um, of, of how this gets done. We then, Traversed over to Sandler, we went to the actual brain bank itself. So you can see a picture here uh, of individuals um, getting ready to enter into the brain bank. And then Salvo uh, really in a detailed fashion going through kind of a crash course in real life anatomy. I will say one of the most surprising and, and, and most um, enjoyable aspects of this was really seeing the reactions, the level of interest in learning more about brain health we only had one individual who felt you know, a little bit uncomfortable, but everybody else was overly engaged. Um, there was a lot of competition actually just to get into the small, uh, the small room, but we did rotate. So uh, we had two groups of individuals who were, were able to join us as, as we went through um, the different activities. After this, we, we went over to uh, STEM, uh, which many folks have probably been to and enjoyed a group lunch. And then we finished up really with a, a discourse. So this is where Salvo and I opened the floor to the community members and really asked them about what worked, what didn't work, things that they found enjoyable, et cetera. I want to just highlight one of the quotes as I realize time is, is, is slipping away, but just one of the quotes that potentially shares how impactful just a half day with folks were, uh, was, excuse me, around this topic. So we posed the open-ended question of, what did you think about donating your brain for research prior today to compare to now after the event? And the individual who contributed this said, before we started talking about it, I was thinking, if you do that, what are you going to do at the funeral? What is your face going to look like? This fear of physical disfigurement because of a lack of knowledge about how autopsy is done. And then she followed by saying, but after he talked about it, Dr. Spina and your face is still intact and everything is still intact, I was like, okay, it's a thought. It's a thought, I might actually think about doing this. So taking somebody from a standpoint of having really not a great understanding of what happens during a brain donation and a lot of fear and you know um, concern about the process to actually being con to considering essentially brain donation themselves. We were able to do this with just a single day's visit. What is the potential impact of this? So Again, we focus on creating this intimate experience, but one of the questions that might come to mind is, well, what is this going to actually do for the community? 
So this is actually what is represented by the 13 individuals that we had come to the center. So we had, we essentially tried to promote a dyad approach. So we had individuals bring a friend, a neighbor, somebody from their church so that they would feel more comfortable at the center. And we really reached pretty far in terms of the community. I have to also thank everybody who's been involved in our community outreach efforts, because that's how we were able to generate this group of individuals. So we went as far as picking up individuals from Vallejo, which is about an hour north of here, to bring them to the center. Quite a bit of representation within San Francisco and also some within the East Bay as well. I wanna share in the table here, just a demographic breakdown of some of the neighborhoods that were represented. So as we think about ethnocultural representation, as we think about representation in terms of socioeconomic status, education as well, you can see there's quite a bit of diversity in terms of the different neighborhoods represented where most of the African-American population, for example, in San Francisco lives in the Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood. Um, we have quite a bit of representation of African-American individuals also in Vallejo, less so in areas like Berkeley, et cetera. In terms of households below poverty, you can see that quite a few, almost a quarter um, in the Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood, quite a few in Berkeley as well. And then also educational diversity, where you can see that individuals in the Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood of San Francisco, not many of them, more than 75%, um, do not actually have a, a bachelor's degree or above. In terms of the organizations that were represented, so again, faith-based organizers, organizations like the Third Street Baptist Church of Christ, the Lutheran Church of Our Savior. We also had senior centers represented. We had individuals who also represented national groups, national coalitions, like the um, National Council of Negro Women and, and the NAACP, specifically the Vallejo chapter. As I kind of alluded to, being able to even assemble these individuals, this group of individuals is built upon really years at this point worth of community work. So this is a map demonstrating just the community outreach efforts over the course of 2022. Many folks are probably familiar with this because I've shown it before. So we actually engaged 17 different community-based organizations. This is just San Francisco and Vallejo and, and excuse me, um, Oakland and, and, and a kind of Berkeley area. There are others as well in San Jose and further north. But of these 17 different community-based organizations, you can see quite a diversity in terms of whether or not they are senior, set of, senior centers, uh, faith-based organizations, social justice initiatives, et cetera, and just the sheer number of folks that we were able to kind of meet in the community and engage about brain health. So in summary, a um, couple of take-home points. We know that brain bank diversification is desperately needed, far beyond just more representation of ethnocultural groups. There's very little actually known, at least per our, our um, cohort, about the logistical process of brain donation. And actually explaining this and providing information around this really was able to change the thought process about brain donation for many of the individuals who we were able to entertain that day. Um, barriers to brain donation for our local African-American population may actually differ from those reported in the literature. We talked a little bit about spirituality um, being potentially one that, that's been reported in the literature that may be not so much for, for our group. And then we know that community ambassadors have potentially a much greater impact than traditional educational approaches. Things like simple webinars, sending out PowerPoint slides, may be effective, but actually being able to meet community members who can go back to their communities and share the information may be a more effective approach. And then finally, ongoing presence in the community really being a key component of how we were able to do this work. Uh, again, tremendous thanks to Victor, to GBHI for all the support. Tremendous thanks to Salvo as well for all of his contributions and happy to entertain any questions. Yeah, <clears throat> so, so the idea being that many individuals um, indicate that, you know, they're willing to donate their organs on like their DMV, um, their, their driver's license, for example. So if they're to pass away in an accident, they're willing to donate their organs in that setting. There was a disconnect where many individuals thought that by signing up for that process, it actually also entailed them donating their brain. And so we spent quite a bit of time explaining 
the, the, the separation between the two and really the importance of brain donation for specifically a research purpose uh, and how it's separate from you know, donation of organs in something like a catastrophic accident. You know, you're changing it. And so the timing of this is so important and so perfect. Uh, and so thank you. That, this is just a comment. Thank you sure. for what you're doing. I hope we can keep up with the improvements that are being made in the, the clinical floor within the, the you know, brain donation program. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I think um, that's why there was no table at the end saying now we have 100 folks who are African American in the brain bank. But it's the start, right? It's the start such that, you know, hopefully decades down the road, maybe not even that long down the road, there's, there's much more representation. Sure. Thank you. Really amazing, thanks so much for that. I'm not gonna take any of your time except ask Elena Soy to come up. Elena is our current scholar in the Population Health and Brain Health Equity Program. Uh, psycho, yeah. <laughs> Psychometric and ecologic val validity of neuropsychological assessment, no surprise, in diverse <laughs> populations. And also thanks to Kate uh, Posting, her, her mentor for this. Um, I'm so excited to be here. And really, I'm just so humbled that I'm following Charles's amazing updates. And uh, I do want to mention that I think the work that Charles is doing is just so critical for all of the work that all of us are doing. You know, whatever, whether you're doing clinical research, whether you're doing clinical pathological research, whether you're doing biomarker research, uh, enrollment, I think, of participants in these uh, cohorts that we study is extremely important. And that's something that I'm also going to briefly mention as part of my talk. So I want to study, I want actually to start with an exercise that I really like to do. This is actually based on my real clinical case. As you know, I'm a clinical neuropsychologist, so, um, and I speak Russian. So I see a lot of Russian speaking patients in clinic. So this is a 65 year old woman with high school education who completed, what is this test? Trails A, correct. So she completed Trails A in 61 seconds. Can anybody tell me what they think about this? about this result. Is this okay? Is this slow? Is this fast? Is this average? Any thoughts? <laughs> is your nephew a 65 year old Russian speaking woman? <laughs> Um, but yeah, basically, if you use the normative data, which is what psychologists use in order to interpret the results, in order to basically say, is this normal or abnormal, right? Uh, this is the data generated in the US. So I am going to choose the bracket that my patient falls into demographically, right? She has high school education. She's 65 years old. So the mean time to complete this test in this population is 29.8 seconds. So by applying this rule and comparing it to the normal bell curve, which is again, how we interpret performance, my patient is extremely impaired, correct? Her Z score or you know how far away she is from the mean is in the impaired range. She's at less than first percentile. I should say that she is impaired. However, if I look at the normative data on this exact test, looks exactly the same and is administered in exactly the same way across different countries, you can see that the Z-score or, you know, the standard score, the interpretation actually changes significantly. If I compare my patient to the Argentinian patients, she is at mean. Canadian patients, patients in Denmark, or for patients in Italy, she's even a little bit better than the mean, right? So I think it's just a very interesting idea to think about, you know, whether this is something that is very culture specific. So maybe some cultures are slower than others. You know, that's an interpretation that somebody can think about. You know, maybe in some cultures it's just they're just slower in general, right? Or maybe, just maybe, there's something wrong with our tests, right? Maybe something that we're measuring or we're assuming that we're measuring is just not the same across cultures. And this is really what generates this entire research project I'm going to be talking about. So 
Neuropsychology, as you know, plays a critical role in the diagnosis and also in monitoring of ADRD. You know, many of the diagnostic criteria include neuropsychology as a part of the actual assessment. So I think when we think about neuropsychology in this rapidly changing world, we also need to think about what is the value of neuropsychology in a world that's becoming more and more uh, diverse, both in terms of race and ethnicity, but also linguistics, you know, immigration and all the other different socioeconomic aspects. This is actually something that Charles already showed, so I'm not going to go into it, but basically you can see that the population, projected population of the U.S. is actually going to become more and more diverse, particularly among uh, individuals 65 and older. And then uh, because age is the main uh, risk factor for dementia, you know, if we look outside of the U.S. and we look at the world globally, actually because of the increased longevity in many of the low and middle income countries, the prevalence of dementia is going to rise most substantially in those regions. And um, because we know that the prevalence is rising, we also have to keep our, you know, our eyes on diagnostic disparities. We need to be able to, to say that you know, we are able to diagnose these people early, connect them to interventions, and actually do the job that we all signed up to do as clinicians, right? However, study after study actually shows that the rates of underdiagnosis or underrecognition of neurodegenerative diseases, particularly at earlier stages, is much higher in low and middle income countries. In some countries, it's reported as over 90% of patients who have a neurodegenerative disease are not recognized at all in medical care. And in high income countries, you might think, well, we have the resources, we have all the tertiary care. Actually, racially and ethnically and linguistically diverse individuals are much less, are much more likely to be underdiagnosed and misdiagnosed with neurodegenerative disease. So um, this is actually a report that Kate and I uh, contributed to this uh, amazing uh, publication put together by ADI, which I highly recommend reading, not for the sake of reading our piece, but I think in general, they just compiled a really good uh, journey of how people undergo the diagnosis of dementia around the world. Anyway, but coming back to neuropsychology, you know, I think oftentimes when we think about neuropsychology, you can pull up when you go to when you get a PhD in neuropsychology, you pull up a textbook, right? And you look at the textbook and there are so many different tests, tests of attention, 50 pages of all the different tests you can do, right? However, the majority of these textbook level neuropsychological tests are developed and validated, meaning that they work for and in very specific populations. In particular, Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, uh, and democratic, otherwise weird, my favorite acronym that Victor did not know, by the way, that I taught him about, um, the weird populations or weird samples constitute on average 12% of the global population. However, looking at the published data, 96% of peer reviewed behavioral science research studies are published using these samples and 99% of developmental neuroscience studies are published using word samples. So really, what do we know about the development and about the validity of the measures that we're developing is restricted to this non very representative population. So I think by reading all of these amazing studies about how Trails A is the greatest test of processing speed ever, you might think that an excellent reliability and validity that was shown in this one group, why would it not work in another group, right? However, that's not how science works, right? Without actual experimentation, you, you should never extrapolate a validity of a neuropsychological test to a completely different group just based on studies made in one group. So um, here, as you think about, you know, what are some of the reasons why Trails A doesn't work? You start thinking about uh, typical sources of bias. Bias is something that neuropsychologists are really allergic to. We don't like error, but we are allergic to bias because bias means systematic error, right? It means that you're consistently seeing wrong or inaccurate findings in a specific group of people or using a specific measure. So there are different types of bias, but I will briefly go over them. So construct bias is the most common one. And construct bias, bias basically indicates that we are not measuring the same construct that we are thinking that we're measuring. I really like this classic example, actually from a neuropsychology textbook that there was a big survey done across European countries called Europeans Value Survey. Maybe Europeans can tell me if they uh, completed one. But what they found as a part of that survey, they were doing it longitudinally, is that participants in Spain consistently were different from everybody else on the question of loyalty to their government. Consistently, they were just lower and lower and lower. And then when they looked into the data, they actually found that the word 
fidelidad, I believe is the word. Please, Spanish speakers, correct me. <laughs> the way that it was translated actually did not refer to loyalty to a construct like a government, but actually more related to like fidelity in terms of like intimate relationships. So when participants were answering these questions, they were not thinking about loyalty to their government. They think about loyalty to their spouse, right? Which is a very different construct. Ideally, you would have both, but very different. So <laughs> the idea is, the construct bias was introduced early on into this survey data. And so it makes it very difficult on the, you know, on the back end when you try to make sense of these data to actually try and understand what's going on, unless you um, make sure that you know, you're controlling for all of these things early on. Another thing is a method bias, which is basically a, an umbrella term that refers to all the different types of nuisance factors that interfere with the neuropsychological assessment. Probably one of the most common ones is administration bias. You know, when you work, if any of you have ever worked with somebody who comes from a different culture and you say, go as fast as you can. And they're like, I am going as fast as I can. And you're like, no, 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 go as fast as you can. And they're like, mm -hmm, yep, I am going as fast as I can, you know? So I think the, this general idea that people are able to engage with you in a similar way as somebody, as somebody who the test was developed on uh, introduces, again, bias in your measurement. And then finally, item bias really is a combination of both construct and method bias that exists on an individual level, on a single item level of um, a certain scale or a test that you're using. And the most, in your psychology, the most notorious one is probably the news item on the Boston naming test that was only removed last year. You know, for generations, neuropsychologists have been trained and uh, to work with African-American population who have undergone a horrible history by showing them the news and asking them to tell us exactly the word news, which is absolutely awful. Another example that I really like to bring up is actually one of the few studies that was conducted in indigenous populations. <clears throat> and this is a study by uh, Roselli that was done in actually indigenous populations in Northern Colombia. And what they did is use this very frequently, can anybody tell me what that is actually? I see neuropsychology fellow, I'm gonna ask them, what's this? Correct, radio complex figure, one of the most commonly used tests of visual spatial function and memory, right? So you would show this to somebody, ask them to copy it, and then you would ask them to remember it later from their memory. So if you look at the actual performance in Colombian Arawakos, who are the indigenous group, and in Colombian sort of Western or, you know, populations that lived more in urban areas, the performance was very, very different, even though they were matched on most of the characteristics, right? except for education. But the thing is, I think the one thing that really stands out to me is that when they looked at what people qualitatively were doing, the majority of the indigenous peoples were saying, this is a nonsense figure. I don't have a reason to be accurate. I don't have a reason to like do it right, right? And I also don't have a reason to remember it. Why would I keep something in my memory that I do not need, right? So I think, this is a combination of both a construct bias where you're not measuring your spatial skill or you're not measuring memory because there are too many factors that just don't relate. The construct is irrelevant to the population. And also the method bias where the administration protocol needed to be actually culturally adapted in order to explain to the participant what they're doing and why they're doing it. All right, moving on. The current project that I'm working on is actually hoping to accomplish something that um, combines my interest in statistics and also combines my interest in diversifying the actual arsenal of neuropsychological tools that we have. So we plan to examine psychometric and ecological validity of both traditional paper and pencil measures and digital tablet-based cognitive measures in diverse populations. And our overarching goals is to further the knowledge of cross-cultural neuropsychology uh, and the differences that we see in cognitive performance, and also to inform the selection of optimal neuropsychological tests that minimize cultural bias and maximize uh, measurement uh, uh, accuracy across different populations. This is really close to my heart because I'm involved in so many projects and I'm really grateful to be able to work with many of Atlantic fellows on projects that incorporate a lot of the cognitive measures. And we want to be able to use empirical data to support use of certain measures in different populations. So um, in order to establish the psychometric validity, you know, fancy term, but really all it refers to is that we want to establish something called measurement invariance or measurement equivalence. This is really a concept that 
relates to the fact that we cannot possibly make valid inferences about differences in the abilities of people if these abilities do not relate to the test scores that we observed in exactly the same way, right? So basically measurement invariance is established when two people from two different groups who have exactly the same true ability that we cannot measure. Let's say Kate and I have exactly the same memory, although we don't, Kate has better memory than me. But imagine that we do, and then we take the same test and we would, we would achieve the exactly same test score. That is measurement invariance. It means the test is not biased, both of us perform it the same way. So the way that you would approach it methodologically in neuropsychology is using the confirmatory factor analysis, where basically we examine the relationship between the theoretical construct, you know, memory or attention or executive skills and their manifest or observed value, something like a CBLT score. And so if we establish that the factor loadings are actually similar across different racial and ethnic groups, we at least have some evident preliminary evidence to say that, hey, this test actually appears to measure the same construct across groups of interest. And so for our aims, <clears throat> aim one is to examine potential measurement bias. And we are going to use the UDS battery primarily because it is the one of the most commonly used ones, but also the one that we typically recommend for harmonization across different uh, studies, like for example, Red Lab. And also TAPCAT measures that are continuously being used in a lot of different studies. And I also think one of the best things about doing this is that digital tools actually allow us so much more of data points to look at. So we might be able to do a more um, uh, refined analysis uh, using digital data. So our hypothesis is that based on prior studies, we presume that there will be certain measures that will likely not meet the criteria for um, measurement invariance, meaning that they will be cultural bias. And those measures are much more likely to be measures in the domains of attention, speed, working memory, and probably executive function tests. Whereas measures of memory and visual spatial skills likely will be a little bit more invariant or less biased. And then our aim two is really to examine the strength of the associations between cognitive measures and functional measures. I think this is something that this is an anecdotal kind of anecdotes that I've been hearing from many different clinicians, you know, like somebody has a CDR of, I don't know, 0.5, but they're completely cognitively impaired. And like, it's really weird. How can somebody have this, you know, this high of a CDR? And then I think the general relationship between functional and cognitive abilities has not been um, established in across different racial and ethnic groups. We just presume that they are as highly correlated in racially and ethnically diverse groups as they are in our typical weird samples, please. <coughs> that is a great question, Gil. I was hoping somebody would ask that. There is, There are literally no studies to show us that CDR is highly valid in these populations. And again, anecdotally, a lot of people say it probably is not, right? Um, but I think one of the ways that we want to address this is look at multiple outcomes. So CDR is one, maybe we're, we're gonna use the FAQ as well if it's being collected, you know, so to have at least multiple outcomes. But I agree with you. I think the issue with functional impairment measurement is also massive. Maybe we should do a measurement variance study on the CDR. <laughs> um, and 